Este webinar é uma iniciativa da editora Oficina de Textos. Eu sou a Maitê e faço parte da equipe. Hoje estamos com mais um tema, Regeneração e Restauração das Florestas Tropicais, com Robin Chesdon. Robin Chesdon é professora de Ecologia da Universidade de Connecticut. Atualmente é diretora executiva da Associação de Biologia Tropical e Conservação e diretora da Rede de Coordenação de Pesquisa de Pessoas e Reflorestamento nos Trópicos. Robin trabalha como consultora global e regional de iniciativas de restauração. É autora de mais de 140 análises em artigos científicos e coeditora de dois livros. A autora é colaboradora nas pesquisas da Universidade de São Paulo, no Instituto Internacional de Sustentabilidade no Rio de Janeiro, e também atua como professora de pesquisas da University of Sunshine Coast em Queensland, na Austrália. Além disso, a autora é membro sênior do Instituto de Recursos Globais, juntamente com a Iniciativa de Restauração Global. Bom, como todos sabem, a gente lançou recentemente o livro da professora, se chama Renascimento de Florestas, Regeneração na Era do Desmatamento. Ele aborda o uso de solos, perturbações em florestas tropicais, trajetórias sucessionais, regeneração florestal, diversidade na fauna durante a regeneração, funções ecossistêmicas, restauração e reflorestamento, entre outros temas. Ao longo de 15 capítulos, apresenta uma profunda compreensão das florestas em regeneração, além de proporcionar ainda uh, ações de restauração ecológica. É, esse trabalho, pessoal, é o fruto de mais de 25 anos de pesquisa da professora em diferentes regiões e com diferentes colaboradores num, um, em um rico trabalho bibliográfico. É uma obra essencial, aliás, para quem trabalha com manejo de restauração de florestas tropicais, para compreender os impactos de fatores, dos fatores geográficos e socioeconômicos no desmatamento e na regeneração florestal. Lembrando que o webinar vai ser a apresentação, a, a professora Robin vai apresentar em inglês, e o PowerPoint dela está em português, tá? Ela teve todo esse trabalho maravilhoso aí de passar para o português para facilitar bastante para o pessoal que está assistindo com a gente. Uh, muito obrigada, Maite, e todos em Oficina de Texto. So, we hear every day about deforestation and the tragedy of loss of biodiversity and all of the other associated problems. But how often do we think about nature's ability to regenerate, to regrow, and to recover after deforestation? This is the subject of the book I wrote and this, uh, the subject of this webinar and I will focus on tropical forests. Why did I write this book? Because uh, deforestation is still continuing all around the world, and there are active fronts of deforestation shown in red on this map. In last year, in 2016, deforestation in the Brazilian Amazon reached an eight-year high. Uh, which was an increase of 29% from the previous year. So we still are dealing with rampant deforestation around the world. But at the same time, we are learning every day more and more about how natural regeneration has the potential to generate multiple benefits for local people, for regions and municipalities, and also globally. The deforestation and the use of forest or transformation of forest for agriculture does not have to be the end of the story. There is a very strong global movement embodied by many efforts, including the Bond Challenge, to restore 200 and 350 million hectares by the year 2030. We have many questions about how much of this goal can be restored through natural regeneration. This is an answer we do not have. We don't even know at this point how much natural regeneration exists globally. And it is much harder to detect natural regeneration than to detect deforestation. <clears throat> One reason uh, this is so difficult is that young forests or 
if you think about it from the agriculture perspective, old field are not classified as forests. So they are not counted when we do assessments of forest cover. These young forests, as you see here, this is in Sao Paulo State, they are often recleared after only a few years and they never have a chance to grow up and become a forest. They are often classified as degraded land and become prime target areas for activities such as planting oil palm and planting monoculture tree plantations. But there is another route, another trajectory for these young forests. And in the proper conditions, they can become forests. We can learn a lot about how people think about forests from looking at the traditional knowledge and societies and civilizations that have relied on forests very closely in their lives. These societies view forests as a cycle where the forest, a, a part of the forest is cleared and planted and cultivated for a short period of time. And then that area is abandoned for, to grow as fallow and slowly the forest regrows. And after sufficient time has passed and the soil is regenerated, that area can be cleared again and used for planting. Many indigenous groups around the world recognized the regenerative capacity of forest and utilized this uh, capacity to benefit their livelihoods. And their lives were completely interwoven with the forest growth cycle. Wouldn't it be nice if we could do this again today? We know that forests have been used by people for thousands of years in some areas, particularly in Brazil. We have evidence that the fertility of the soil was enhanced, allowing permanent cultivation of crops. Here on the right, you can see terra preta soils enriched with carbon and nutrients. Sites with terra preta soils are very common, especially along the banks of major rivers all across the Amazon basin. We know from other evidence as well, that these areas were permanent settlements dating from 1,000 to 2,500 years ago. Ancient civilizations left many signs of extensive occupation in southeastern Brazil and Bolivia that have only been revealed by deforestation and creation of pasture that show these um, amazing formations. These formations are thought to be linked to religious celebrations. I emphasize the importance of understanding the ancient uses of forest because they demonstrate that deforestation and management of tropical forests are not just an issue in the modern era and these forests in the tropics, as we know them today, have developed with a strong influence of humans. So the concept of what is pristine or virgin or primary is really a relative concept. It is a human construct. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Forests are also subject to a wide variety of destructive forces from volcanic eruptions. Here this is in Krakatoa, Indonesia. From landslides, this is in Puerto Rico. From mudslides associated with heavy rains and hurricanes. Uh, this is Casita volcano in Nicaragua um, that was affected by Hurricane Mitch. Uh, by flooding of rivers and by large windstorms. This can happen even in the middle of Amazonia. Because they have grown 
historically through all of these kinds of natural disturbances, forest ecosystems already know how to regenerate. And these disturbances have always been a part of their environment to which they are adapted. When we think about the process of succession or the development of an ecosystem after it has been disturbed, we see there are two major factors that influence these process, this process. One um, is the availability of propagules or seeds. The second one is the availability of resources for plant growth. <clears throat> and these two types of conditions vary considerably. And the combination of these two factors affects the type of succession and how quickly it can progress over time. So I will, some examples here, the case one labeled uh, primary succession is what happened in Krakatau volcano in 1883, which was left with no soil and is an island very distant from any sources of seed. In case five, we have a pasture abandoned on relatively fertile soil and with remnant trees nearby. But case six is the same kind of pasture that did not have remnant trees nearby. And case seven would be a shifting cultivation area a field in a side of a forest matrix. So you can see the conditions that influence succession very, very, very widely. And we can, we're now beginning to understand how we can use uh, this information to predict where succession is most likely to happen. During the initial stages of forest succession, the trees that first colonize the site are called pioneer trees, and they colonize and grow very rapidly in disturbed areas. These include short-lived and long-lived pioneers. The short-lived pioneer species come in, they grow very quickly, occupy the canopy, and they die, often within 10 to 20 years. But the long-lived pioneers can remain uh, and grow to very large sizes. During this stage, we also see the colonization of generalist tree species. And these come in also during the initial stage and share the forest with the pioneers. Then after a while, species more typical of old growth or um, later successional species begin to colonize. And this signals kind of a new stage in the development of the forest. At this point, the short-lived pioneers have pretty much left the scene. So we have the long-lived pioneers, the generalist trees, and we start to see recruitment of older or later successional species. This period lasts a very long time. It could be um, many decades. And then we start to see occupation of the canopy by the late successional trees and a few of the generalist species. And we can say that when the long-lived pioneers are no longer present in the forest, then we really have an old growth forest again. Pioneer species can still colonize in an old growth forest um, in areas where trees have died and there's there are disturbances inside the forest. And it's important to realize that disturbance really is a way of life in a forest and does not signal um, the death of a forest in any way. This is a photograph of a very early stage forest um, in central Amazonia dominated by short-lived pioneer species. This is Cecropia chiadophila. Sometimes these pioneer species can form almost uh, single species stands in the canopy. 
we have been following individual areas of regenerating forest in Costa Rica over many years. And in this particular site, we started when the forest was 12. We documented the changes in composition in the relative abundance of species in three different groups. The second growth specialists, the old growth specialists, and the generalists. And you can see here, over time, in the dark circles, closed circles, the second growth specialists were initially more than 70% of the stems in the forest. But this began declining very rapidly. <clears throat> During that same time, the generalist species in the open circles started increasing and are now the most dominant trees in the forest. And then on the bottom, the old growth specialists very, very slowly are starting to increase in their relative abundance in the trees, but they're still relatively small trees. So we can document these shifts in the types of species that are coming into the forest over time. The um, old growth specialist trees can take many, many decades or even centuries to become established in the forest canopy. These tend to be very slow growing trees and many of them have low abundance naturally in the forest. So the likelihood that seeds will become dispersed in any one area can be very small. Here is a picture of that forest uh, that I just took one month ago in Costa Rica. This forest is now 32 years old and you can see um, many species, uh, particularly these palms in the subcanopy, that are old growth specialists that are moving in and now becoming very established in this forest. <coughs> Excuse me. This is a process that takes a very long time, so how do we study it? We don't have the advantage always of, of following a site for every year. So uh, the approach that we use mostly is to um, identify sites of different age and use age as a substitute for time. This is called a chronosequence approach. And here you see some results from a, a study done by researchers in Oaxaca in Mexico, where uh, you can describe the changes of many different aspects of forest structure and forest composition over time using sites of different age. And if you have enough variation in your sites, you can quantify things like confidence intervals and variation in these rates of recovery. So things like canopy height, basal area, species richness, and uh, species density can all be, uh, all show pronounced changes over time during, uh, particularly during the earlier stages or the first 30, 40 years of, of natural regeneration. Another important factor to think about is that as these different qualities of the forest are changing, we have um, associated changes, interrelated changes in both biodiverse in three factors in biodiversity, in forest structure, and in ecosystem function. And all of these can be charted um, individually over time as in the previous graph. But in fact they are all interrelated and that is one of the most important areas of research today is understanding how uh, all of these three different components of forests change over time and how they are related to each other. And this is very important for restoration, especially if we're interested in conserving biodiversity and protect and, and um, <clears throat> providing ecosystem services in forests, we need to understand how those processes recover naturally. As forests regrow, they accumulate biomass in the trees and in other vegetation as well. And this is the major reason why forest regeneration is such an important component for mitigating climate change. But trees 
need rain to grow, and the more rain that they get, the more biomass they can accumulate. So this is a study of biomass accumulation in dry forests in the tropics, showing that the amount of biomass accumulation increases with dry forests that have more annual rainfall. A broader study that was published last year found a more than 11-fold variation in the above-ground biomass as recorded, as modeled after 20 years of regeneration. So this was based on 45 different chrono sequences from sites all over the neotropics, the neotropical lowlands. And what our analysis showed very clearly is that much of this variability is explained by annual rainfall. So in wetter areas, there's a much higher potential to accumulate biomass in 20 years than in an area that's receiving only 1,000 millimeters of rain. <clears throat> Excuse me. Another thing that happens over time in these forests, at least that we hope will happen over time, is the recolonization of fauna. And the fauna are responding to the different resources that become available in the, in the forest, such as different kinds of fruits um, and, and shelter as well. And also many of these are pollinators. So they come in search of nectar and pollen. Over time, um, the interactions between the plants and the animals increase and become more complex as well. One of the patterns that has been most demonstrated is the changes in seed size and fruit size that occur um, during the process of forest regeneration. And here you can see that the um, percentage of plants that have small seeds in the top diagram in the dark circles, that percentage decreases over time. And the percentage of plants with larger seeds is increasing over time. These are all uh, seeds that are dispersed by vertebrates. So the kinds of resources that become available in the forest for animals are also changing dramatically over time. And the animals that are coming in uh, can bring uh, larger seeds over time. And that is how some of these larger seeded species become established. The main dispersal agents in tropical forests are bats and birds. Large birds, such as toucans, are particularly important for dispersing large seeds. But also some bats, even very small bats, can also disperse large fruits and, and large seeds. So it is very important that, these, that the fauna is uh, present in regions where forests are regenerating because they are extremely important for bringing seeds and particularly bringing seeds from older forest fragments into younger forest fragments. So how can we apply some of this knowledge to the big task of forest restoration? Here is a framework that allows us to consider three different factors. One is the cost of, of restoration. The other is the benefits that restoration provides for biodiversity and ecosystem services. And the th third factor is the initial state of degradation of the land. Uh, and this mostly has to do with soil degradation. <clears throat> In the cases I have been talking about with natural regeneration, this is the lowest cost and has the highest benefits. But it is also restricted to areas that have a relatively low state of degradation of soil. If you recall the graph of the uh, soil resources that are important for restoration, for, for forest regeneration. So it, in the cases where the soils have been more degraded, it's necessary to use other approaches and if they're only slightly degraded, we can do facilitated or assisted uh, regeneration and uh, help to uh, reduce weeds, 
help to perhaps fertilize some of the trees that are coming in. Um, it may be necessary to plant trees, uh, preferably native species, if we want the biodiversity benefits. Um, we can also uh, establish agroforests or commercial forestry plantations in, in areas where natural regeneration cannot be facilitated or where there's a need uh, for income. And then in the most severe cases, uh, restoration will, will take the form of uh, recuperation or rehabilitation, where the goal is not to reestablish a forest, but to increase productivity of the land. This is an example of natural uh, assisted regeneration, a technique which was developed in the Philippines. <clears throat> in many areas, tree seedlings can colonize, as you see here, but there is very dense cover of this is an invasive grass called imperata. And if nothing is done, the grass will completely outcompete and smother and kill the tree seedlings. But if you go in and locate the tree seedlings and clear away the grass and smash down the grass with some wood, it kills the grass. And if you keep doing this over time, the seedlings will grow bigger and stronger and will be able to grow into trees and you end up with a forest without having to plant trees. So the conditions for this approach are that you have a certain density of, of tree seedlings in the area. Another example of assisted regeneration has been widely used um, in Ethiopia and in other parts of, of the drylands in Sahel and Africa. And this is an example in a national park in Humbo in Ethiopia, where there were many stumps. The forest had been very cut over and degraded, um, and, but there were many stumps remaining. And when those stumps are pruned properly, uh, they re-sprout and a whole new crown develops. And they were able to restore this forest after only seven years, restoring a dense forest in this region without planting any trees. So I think it's important to think about where, under what conditions and where is it favorable for natural regeneration to take place in landscapes. From a variety of, of studies that have been done in many different countries, a number of conditions have emerged consistently. One is uh, steeper slopes, higher elevations, and mountainous terrain. Often all of these three things go together. These are areas where we tend to see natural regeneration occurring. A second factor is proximity to forest fragments and water sources. <clears throat> Third, areas that have relatively poor access or, and that are far from roads are also more likely to undergo natural regeneration. And areas that have relatively low soil disturbance. And finally, areas that have remnant vegetation or root stocks in the soil will also show much better likelihood of natural regeneration. In this photograph on the right, which is taken in Costa Rica, shows an area where the understory of the forest was cleared and the forest is essentially um, in the process of deforestation. Whoops, I'm sorry. Um, <clears throat> but there's a lot of remnant trees in the area. And you can imagine that if you put up a fence in this region and remove the cattle, that very rapidly uh, this area would regenerate back into a forest. And one of the ways of describing all of this remnant vegetation and proximity, proximity to seed sources is the concept of ecological memory. That is, there are many elements present in this landscape to help the forest remember what it was like before and how it can become a forest again. <clears throat> but the biggest barriers to natural regeneration are social, economic, and political. While the forest is growing back, how can landowners or farmers receive some economic benefits 
for not using that land for agricultural production? Can we expect them to just take their cows off and that will not have any impact on their livelihood? Second, we need to create a much more favorable policy environment for, that will promote natural regeneration. The policy environment has been much more favorable for tree planting than for spontaneous or assisted regeneration. Third, we need to do a much better job of assessing the extent of natural regeneration and for quantifying its potential for restoring forests in the future. And this is going to require some new approaches such as uh, the use of collect earth, which is now uh, becoming a tool for doing a much more detailed analysis of, of tree cover, including natural regeneration. Finally, natural regeneration has, has sort of been an orphan in the sense that these are areas that have been sort of abandoned by many conservation groups because they aren't as important to conserve, perhaps as a fully developed old growth forest that is full of biodiversity. And they've been neglected by the agriculture sector uh, because in fact these are, exist because agriculture was abandoned. And um, there are very poor um, uh, examples of silvicultural management of secondary forests, even though I think there's a very high potential for this. So I, <clears throat> there needs to be a, a new approach that allows natural regeneration to really become integrated within the sectors of conservation, agriculture, and forestry in, in a way that hasn't happened before. <clears throat> now I'm going to show um, a couple of things from more recent studies. Um, what I showed you already is material I had in the book. This is a, a study that was based on that analysis of the potential for uh, biomass recovery.
so what we what we have done in this study is um, to assess how much carbon um, regenerating forests could store if they were just allowed to regrow for 40 more years. So we looked at what was present in 2008, uh, estimated the age of those forests, and then used our models to calculate the carbon potential based on the climate and rainfall in that area. And when we total this up for all of the lowland tropics, we got 8.5 petagrams of carbon stored over 40 years. And that means 31 petagrams of CO2. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so yes, we didn't quite know what this number means. So we started looking at uh, how we could translate that. And we discovered that this is equivalent to all of the emissions of the fossil fuel and industrial processes in all of Latin America and the Caribbean for 21 years. We had to go back to 1993 to 2014, totaling up all of that for all of these countries to get 31 petagrams of CO2. Uh, so this seems to us to be a very significant finding and a big motivation for um, a very high potential for carbon storage without having to pay anything. This is just spontaneous regrowth. So we could get much more than this if we also uh, converted some marginal areas of pasture or areas that are poor for agriculture to, to forest restoration. This is only using natural regeneration. So this was a, a very exciting result. <clears throat> Also, there are some recent studies that um, have been trying to document a natural regeneration happening at a pretty large scale. I'm just going to show you a couple of examples from Brazil. This was a study um, in the Rio Cariba do Sul in Sao Paulo. You can see on the map, and the comparison was over 30 years, from 1985 to 2015. And this study found 200, more than 200,000 hectare of native forest, secondary forest, developed from pasture um, spontaneously in those 30-year period, that 30-year period. There also were eucalyptus plantations that came in in this region. That is not included here. This is only the spontaneous natural regeneration. So if you don't look and measure, you want to know that this is happening. And it's happening on pretty large scale in many regions of the world, including in Brazil. In Minas Gerais State, this uh, very recent study also looked at uh, the total pasture area and looked at the potential for natural regeneration within those pasture areas. So this included areas that are in the Atlantic Forest part and in the Cerrado and Caatinga part. And this study found um, that 36 percent, I'm sorry, 30 percent of all of the pasture land in Minas Gerais um, had a medium to high potential for natural regeneration. <clears throat> and then when they looked at the obligation of the forest code for restoration, they found that they could satisfy 36 percent of that obligation using just the spontaneous natural regeneration. And then if they included areas of assisted natural regeneration, which are the blue uh, areas on this map, then that accounted for 75% of the forest code requirement. So that only leaves 25% of the forest code requirement that would require tree planting. <coughs> So this is a, a quite an amazing find that here we have this high potential for natural regeneration to really do the job of, of restoration for us without having uh, to pay all of these costs. So um, this is my big message that natural regeneration gives us a big lever, um, a big way of uh, uh, trying 
being able to achieve these big targets for restoring forests in Brazil and all around the world. And we need a lever because it's a very huge job. Um, so in conclusion, um, under suitable biophysical and social conditions, natural regeneration offers the most cost-effective opportunities for conserving local native biodiversity, for increasing resilience to climate shock, and for production of a diversity of ecosystem services. And I think it's unlikely that the ambitious restoration goals and commitments, such as the Bond Challenge and the New York Declaration on Forests, will be achieved without um, having a major global effort to enable natural regeneration. To enable and protect naturally regenerating forests requires development of and application of new policies and new governance structures and new assessment methodologies. And the tools to identify and map the conditions that are suitable for natural regeneration are urgently needed. As you can see, they can provide a huge amount of, of useful, important information. And I will just close with this picture of a landscape in Ohancha, Costa Rica, where I was visiting in May, that has the people in this landscape have totally transformed it over 40 years. It was a completely degraded pasture landscape, and they have um, enabled natural regeneration and done um, many other activities that promote restoration um, on their own initiative in this area, and it's, it's a very inspiring story. <clears throat> so, muito obrigada. I would really like to thank um, Nino Amazonas and Ricardo Cesar, who were the ones who translated my book and who did such a wonderful job, and Pedro Brancaleon, who really made all of this possible and connected me with Oficina de Textos, and also thanks to so many uh, colegas brasileros who I have met over the years and I hope to continue working with. Thank you very much. <laughs>